friends, guess where we are? We are at finding out who stole New Year's Eve. We are at the end and we're going to get to the end. Okay. Whew. All right. So, in the last chapter, chapter 28, we found out, <coughs> excuse me, that Eve thinks that her father may have something to do with the stealing of the 18 ice sculptures and the theft of Ice Eve, her birthday gift, okay? I personally think her mom might have something to do with it, but I don't know. We got to figure this out today, 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 okay? Chapter 29, Who Stole New Year's Eve by Martha Freeman. Oh, yes. So, the kids, Sophie, Alex, and Eve, have gotten to the RSFV refrigerated warehouse that was built for her father, Professor Henry, for all of his volatile hazardous materials that's going to help him um, make gasoline. Chapter 29. Remind me to give Sophie some good old fashioned mystery novels for her birthday. Because the way it turned out, going into the pitch black warehouse was just as bad an idea as I expected. Right away, it was obvious that the darkness was populated with something because I banged into obstacles everywhere I turned. Then, as if we needed something more to worry about, Marshmallow howled and started barking, danger, danger, danger. It didn't take special skill to know what he meant. Someone was in here, in the dark with us. My heart pounded, my hands shook, my stomach twisted itself in a knot. In comparison, a mere thump on the head was looking good. Ow, Sophie griped. Then ow and ow, my toe. And then she said some words that, must, that she must have learned from Cable. We need a lantern, she added. My phone doesn't throw enough light. Wait, I wonder. And then there was a streak of light sailing near the ceiling of the warehouse. And for a shining moment, we could see. And what we saw were ice sculptures. <gasps> rows and rows of them lined up like zombies staring blindly ahead in the frisbee light. Then one I had... That the one I had just kicked was the zombified Ice Eve herself, and next to her was Ice Santa Claus, and then Chef with a tray of pizza, and then the frisbee hit the far wall, flack, and bounced off, and everything went dark. The thing is, it wasn't only ice sculptures I had seen in the moment of light. Unless I was crazy, something had moved, something with a purple, sh like a purple shadow. And it made me remember how when I, f when I was downtown, I thought I was being followed. That was some, that was something purple too. And hadn't there been something purple in the unfinished house? Marshmallow barked again, then ran to retrieve Sophie's frisbee. I could hear his doggy toenails clickety clicking like crazy across the concrete floor. Meanwhile, I took my own frisbee and tossed it gently, going for a maximum hang time and maximum light. Now the whole warehouse lit up and I could see the sculptures more clearly, their faces distorted and scary because each had melted a bit in its day in the sun. This was just great, glowing, sparkly, half-melted, unseen, zombie-like ice goblins. I already knew they would populate my nightmares for the rest of my life. Marshmallow brought back my frisbee, brought back Eve's frisbee, brought back Sophie's for the second time. For a scared little dog, he was tough. Now we tossed them as soon as they were back so that they rose above the sculptures one after another and then sometimes, oops, collided in midair and dropped to the floor. 
Not to mention they bounced off the ice sculptures too, which was when something strange happened. Sparks, like you'd get from striking a match, followed by what looked like tiny bolts of lightning. At first, I thought they were just reflections from the spinning light up frisbees, but then I saw that they were different, multicolored. Never saw ice act like that before, said Sophie. Me, me, I started to say. But then I saw, streaking from the place where a frisbee had just fallen, a whole bunch of lightning sparks. Poof, poof, poof. A chain reaction that sparked, that spawned a star of linked lightning, like linked lightning, accompanied by poofs and hisses and pops and that was spreading outward fast. Sophie said, huh? Eve said, I don't like the looks of this. Then the hisses and pops got louder and the lightning sparks brightened and multiplied. What did volatile mean again? Suddenly it came to me, might blow up. That's what it meant. You guys, we've got to get out of here. Eve, Sophie and I started backing toward the door marshmallow marshmallow i called come on by now the whole room was brightening with all the nightmare ice sculptures on view weirdly it seemed to be the ice itself producing light the lightning effect kind of like wait a second the video clip of the flame coming out of the faucet. The poof when Uncle Jim disappeared from the video conference. He had been turning on a faucet, right? Had Uncle Jim made the ice sculptures out of water from Bellbird? Oh, chapter 30. <clears throat> there was nothing like a healthy shot of adrenaline to power up the brain. As Eve, Sophie, and I backpedaled toward the warehouse door, I started to work the mystery out. It was never the ice at all the thief wanted. It was the water. Mr. Yoder had made the ice sculptures from the water that came out of his tap. Water polluted by fracking. The, and Professor Henry must have figured out that one of the chemicals polluting the water could be used as the missing ingredient he needed to make gasoline. Oh my goodness. It made a crazy kind of sense. Hadn't Professor Olivo said that catalyzing agent was volatile, that the catalyzing agent was volatile? Unfortunately, now the pulsing bolts of light made the warehouse bright as day and raised the temperature inside too. Marshmallow called Eve. And there he was, at last, maneuvering like a tiny fluff running back, fluff, fluffy running back among the dripping figures. Then zoom, he was out the door. Meanwhile, the sizzle crackle poof had become one thundering rumble and the steamy air felt quivery and electric. Something was about to happen, something big and dangerous. Eve, Sophie, and I had reached the door and were about to cross the threshold to safety when, from the far side of the warehouse, I saw something purple and human-sized. It was familiar not only because it had been following me all day, but also because it was my best friend. What was Yasmin doing here? More importantly, how was she going to get out? With Eve and Sophie safely outside, I reversed direction. By now, the air in the warehouse was warm and sticky, and the light had gone out from gone from bright bright to blinding, and the concrete floor was slick with melting ice. Out of breath, I slid and stumbled forward, tripping on the shrunken remains of Mr. Yoder's sculptures. Suddenly behind me, someone screamed my name, grabbed me around the wrist, and dragged me back toward the door. I fought back. I couldn't leave Yasmin, but whoever had, whoever had me in his or her grip had almost superhuman strength. A few seconds later, I was outside in the dark breathing gulps of cold night air. Oh my goodness. Run, Alex, run. 
run away now, yelled in a very familiar voice. And I knew arguing would be useless. It always is with mom. So I did as I was told and mom rushed back inside to get Yasmin. Chapter 31. When I turned back on the warehouse, I saw Sophie, Eve, and Marshmallow at the edge of the lawn. The girls were waving and I ran toward them. By now I could hear sirens and soon there were blinking red and white lights coming toward us from the road in the distance. I reached the girls. The three of us turned to look at RSFZ. I'm sorry, I said VZ. Then we waited breathlessly for whatever was going to happen next. It didn't take long. There was a flash of multicolored light and whoosh, bang, roar the, that drove a single shockwave, knocking us backwards. Marshmallow hurtled in, hurtled in Eve's arms, howled. I'm sorry, huddled. A blizzard wind kicked up, frigid with the vaporized remains of ice sculptures. It left a layer of icy white on the ground and on us. I wiped my eyes. I realized I was crying. Where was Yasmin? And where was my mom? The noise echoed in my skull for several seconds. Then it got eerily quiet. Then I heard sirens again. Within moments, police cars screamed up, then a fire engine, and after that, two ambulances. Eve, Sophie, and I watched speechlessly while the emergency workers poured out of their vehicles, shone spotlights on the wrecked building, and put up barriers and yellow police tape to seal off the area. Within a few minutes, the fire guys had suited up and swarmed the wreckage. In all the chaos, it was hard to see exactly what was happening. But eventually, the EMS people pulled two backboards out of the ambulance. Where, where, I'm sorry, what are they doing now? Eve asked. They've got patience, Sophie said. Come on, I said. And we headed for the emergency vehicles and what was left of RSFZ. Approaching the taped off boundary, we saw Officer Krishels, who put up his hands to say, stop, hi kids. Now you know I can't let you come any closer. It's too dangerous and we've got our work to do. Is it mom? I tried to ask, yes, mean. Officer Krishels looked really serious. They're going to the hospital, he said, and that's all I can tell you because that's all I know. Suddenly, Bub was there. He had come up behind me, and I was never so glad to see anyone in my life. I've called your dad, Alex, and Yasmin's parents, he said. They'll meet us at the hospital. Your parents are, your parents are coming too, girls. Hop in my truck and let's go. Lying on beds in the hospital's emergency room, Mom and Yasmin both looked terrible. They had braces around their necks. Their faces were pink splotched and scratched. They were hooked up to beeping machines that read their heartbeats and blood pressure. Hanging on metal poles next to their beds were bags of clear liquid connected by tubes to their bandaged arms. The doctors explained that there was medicine in the liquid to kill germs, replace fluids, and to help them sleep. Oh, excuse me. It was scary seeing them that way, but they were alive. I tried to concentrate on that. Detective Parakeet's body has had a severe shock and we won't know the, about the extent of her internal injuries for a while, the doctor explained to my dad and me as we stood by her. Luckily, the burns seemed to be superficial. Only a green curtain separated mom's bed from Yasmin's, and I could hear Yasmin trying to say something. Her parents were in the hall talking to a nurse, so I went around and bent down next to her. What, Yasmin? Can I get you anything? Uh, 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 she croaked, and I could barely hear her. I just wanted to tell you that superficial means not deep. I reported this conversation to Sophie, Eve, and Bub, 
A couple of minutes later, they were in the waiting area outside the emergency room. Bub tried to laugh, but it came out more like a sob. Now I know he wiped his eyes. She'll be okay. A few minutes after that, Professor Henry arrived, no longer looking anything like the confident scientist from the Jensen's disaster party. Instead, he looked sad and uncertain. When he tried to give Eve a hug, she pulled away. My dad came into the waiting room at almost the same moment. The doctor was getting my mom ready for her, ready to move her, I'm sorry. The doctor was getting my mom ready to move her upstairs. He could go see her. We could go see her in her hospital, in her own hospital room later. Compared to Professor Henry, my dad, proprietor of Pie in the Sky Pies, looked totally intimidating. Well, was my dad's greeting what do you have to say for yourself? Professor Henry sighed. I'm sorry is inadequate. It would be smart though, dad said. And after that, how about if you admit responsibility? I'm sorry, Professor Henry said from the bottom of my heart. And I won't make excuses for myself. This dream of mine, Grasoline, has overcome my good sense and my moral sense too. I see that after what's happened tonight, I only hope the damage isn't permanent. Your wife, Miss Pop, are they okay? How are they? The doctors don't know yet, Dad said. They're doing tests and will assess again in the morning. Before Professor Henry could reply to that, Sophie cut him off. I've got some questions for you. Sophie, I said, at this point, shouldn't we let the police? What police, Sophie said. Your mom's not going to be doing a whole lot of detecting for a while yet. I say we help her out. Professor Henry smiled grimly. I don't mind answering your questions. Uh, what's your name again? Sophie put, her hand, put out her hand. Sophie Sakura, and this is Alex Parakeet. We're your neighbors on Chickadee Court. And I guess you remember your daughter, even though you hardly ever have time for her. We've been investigating. The first thing I want to know is when did you start chewing sunflower seeds again? Dad and I looked at Sophie like, what? But Eve giggled which was a pleasant sound under the circumstances. How did you know about that? Professor Henry asked. Never mind, it doesn't matter. Probably a month ago, right before we moved, I was under a lot of stress, but I had to do it in secret because my wife doesn't approve. Maybe if you don't mind, you could back up a little, I said. What was your plan exactly? I mean, I figured out there's a volatile chemical in the fracking liquid, a chemical that you think will work as a catalyst for making gasoline. So you had it frozen into ice sculptures? Professor Henry looked surprised. My wife told me about your rep mm, reputation as a detective, Alex. I see it's deserved. He took a breath. Well, all right. I may as well explain it all. The plan was to transfer the sculptures to RSFZ after Ice Carnival ended. But the weather then but then the weather forecast called called for warming. I was terrified that they might melt. So and if they did, kaboom. Sophie threw her hands in the air. Uh, yes, basically, said Professor Henry. So my students and I grabbed the sculptures from downtown in the dead of night. I knew I could count on them to keep quiet about it. And then I went over to Chickadee Court in my old truck and collected Eve myself. 
By gather them up, you mean you stole them, right, dear? Mrs. Henry had come in from the parking lot. It was in the best interest of science, not to mention the environment. Professor Henry insisted. Grassoline, Mrs. Henry cut him off. Grassoline is not going to do a thing for Yasmin or Detective Parakeet. Professor Henry hung his head and there was an uncomfortable silence. Bub broke it. What you're saying, Professor, puts me in mind of something my friend Al told us the other day. He mentioned how it's pretty near impossible to get a permit from the state for hauling explosives. Professor Henry nodded. That's right. And that's why I was forced to enlist my brother's brother-in-law's help to hide the chemical in the ice sculptures. I was right. I was right. Oh, I'm so sorry you have to go. Hopefully you can hear the rest of the story. So my friends, we are going a little over because we have only one chapter left. Okay. Uncle Jim was in on this, Eve said. Professor Henry nodded. He thought finding a use for dirty fracking water would, go would, be, a good would be good for everyone in the end. Besides, I promised him a share of the proceeds from gasoline. Anyway, we didn't have time to wait for state permits if we were going to be the first to market our product. The competing team from my old university has been hot on our heels. So Sophie was right, I thought, in a way. The motive was money. Professor Henry wanted his kind of gasoline to win the race because if it did, he and Mr. Yoder and the college and a lot of other people would make a ton of money. I remembered something else too. Hadn't my mom's annoying tipster, the one who turned out to be Professor Olivo, warned about poison bombs on the highway? So he wasn't crazy. He knew Professor Henry, Henry was looking for a volatile catalyzing chemical. And he was afraid Professor Henry might be willing to take a chance and transport it illegally, too. A nurse appeared at the emergency room door. Which one of you is Alex? Could you come back for a moment? I figured it was mom who wanted something, but it was Yasmin. This time she was sitting up. Her parents were standing beside her cot. They nodded hello to me, but never took their eyes off their daughter. Alex, Yasmin whispered, I have to tell you something. Oh, honey, said Mrs. Pop, don't tire yourself out. It's important. Yasmin tried to shake her head, but couldn't because of the brace around her neck. She couldn't open her mouth very wide either, which made her hard to understand. My brain's all fuzzy, or I would have thought of it sooner. It's about Luau. Is he okay? Oh my gosh, I had totally forgotten about my cat. I don't know. He was acting strange. Dad took him to the vet, but that was before Alex. Listen, Yasmin interrupted, and the rest came out in a breathless gasp. Luau might be sick. I took him over to the Henry's front yard today. I needed, I needed him to keep Marshmallow out of the way while I looked for clues. When we were there, he drank some of the melted ice from where Ice Eve was standing. I didn't think anything about it till tonight when I saw the sculptures, saw that the sculptures weren't made out of plain water. Alex, listen, you have to find out if your cat's been poisoned. Oh, man. Last chapter, chapter 32. I didn't sleep that night. Except I guess I must have. Because otherwise, how come I woke up the next morning? It was New Year's Day, Eve's birthday. The first day of the year, the worst day of my life. Luau wasn't sitting on my chest or swishing his tail in my face the way he should have been. He was at the vet's, and the vet couldn't promise he'd ever come home. My mom was in the hospital, 
My best friend was in the hospital. Along with Sophie and Eve, I had solved a mystery, but I didn't feel good about it. How could I feel good when my new friend's dad would probably have to go to jail? I washed and got dressed and went downstairs and played video games. Dad knew how I was feeling and didn't even bug me to do anything useful. He just came in, said hello, and left me alone. The plan was to go to the, hosp the hospital after lunch. That was when the doctors were going to decide about mom and Yasmin coming home. At 11 o'clock, the phone rang, and dad picked up the phone in the kitchen. Was it the vet? I went to find out. Mr. Parakeet? Yes, dad was saying. And don't tell me because I know it's a funny name for a cat owner. How is Luau doing? For a few minutes, dad's face didn't give anything away. He just listened and nodded. Then finally, he smiled and gave me a thumbs up. I didn't even realize I'd been holding my breath till I grabbed a gulp of air so big it made me cough. Luau was going to be okay. In the car, on the way to get him, dad told me what the vet had said. It turned out to be lucky Yasmin had told me. I'm sorry. It turned out to be lucky Yasmin had told me when she did about Luau drinking the ice melt. The chemical in the melted ice smells good to cats and dogs, but in their bodies, it acts a lot like antifreeze, the stuff you put in cars. Pets drink antifreeze sometimes because it's sweet, but it's also deadly poison if you don't act fast. Hey, guy, how you feeling? I picked up Luau off the table in the vet's examining room. When I held him close, he clutched me with his paw, with his claws. Alex, get me out of here. There's not a comfy cushion in the place. Luau wasn't the only one who got to go home that day. So did mom and so did Yasmin. The doctors said that they had been lucky too and their injuries weren't severe. Neither one of them could remember exactly what had happened, but they must have been clear that they must have been clear of the warehouse before the blast. I spent the rest of the day nursing patients and I didn't mind at all. My mom was what's known as a good patient. She liked staying in bed with a book and having dad and me bring her tea. She worried that the cuts on her face might scar and she didn't like aching all over. But otherwise, she said it was like a vacation. She also said thank you a lot. The only bad part but she kept mussing up my hair the way I hate. Yasmin and Luau, on the other hand, were terrible patients. Luau, being a cat, was happy to lie around 99% motionless, but he was 100% full of complaints. The pillow was lumpy. The sun was in his eyes. His medicine tasted awful. He was extra grumpy because before we left, the vet had said he should go back on a diet. No more kitty treats. Then there was Yasmin. She couldn't stand to stay still. Her mom had to threaten to tie her down. And the piano is definitely off limits, Mrs. Pop said. Jeremiah was delighted about the last part. You heard mommy said, definitely off limits. Go away, Yasmin told Jeremiah please. She was on the sofa in the den. I was sitting next to her in a chair. Everything hurt, she said, and she didn't feel like reading or watching TV. Do you feel like talking, I said? No, she said. But what? There are still some things about the case I don't get, I said. Like, were you following me yesterday when I was downtown? Not exactly following, she said. I think I actually went downtown before you did. I talked to Tim Roberts. Wait, what? So that's why he hadn't said, where's Yasmin? 
He'd known where she was. She had already been there. I wanted to solve the case as much as you did, but maybe even more because I wanted to show I'm better than your new best friend, Eve. I let that last part go for a moment. Hey, and did you talk to Coach Hathaway too? Yasmin nodded. I ran into him when I was looking for clues. Did you find the sunflower crud? Yasmin made a face. Sunflower crud? Ha, huh. score one for Alex Parakeet. I'll tell you about it later. Then did you go to the unfinished house? I did, she said. I know that part was stupid and I'm sorry, but I was so mad at you, mad at everybody, I guess. Anyway, I wanted to make sure Jeremiah and Billy had moved the lady dancing like I'd asked them to. Only I slipped and knocked over some boards and made a lot of noise. And later you went out to RSFZ, I said. Yasmin nodded. With your mom. What? I knew the ice sculptures had to be at Professor Henry's lab complex. I mean, where else would he have hidden them? Wait a second, I said. You knew Professor Henry stole the sculptures? Duh, Alex. I don't get it. How? Yasmin reached over and picked up a book, The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, from the table next to the sofa. It's all here in a story called Silver Blaze. The clue that incriminates the murderer is a dog that doesn't bark. This was the same situation. Marshmallow barks if a snowflake even hits the ground but he didn't bark when Ice Eve was stolen in the middle of the night. I wondered why not. And then I remembered that in the story, it's the dog's owner that's the bad guy. In this case, the answer was the same. If the thief wasn't an intruder, it basically had to be Professor Henry. I couldn't believe it. I should have just asked Marshmallow, I said. Yasmin sighed. Alex, you're not going to tell me you can talk to Marshmallow, are you? I shook my head. Of course not, I said. I would never tell you that. But go back a second. What about my mom? I would have been stupid to confront Professor Henry on my own, wouldn't I? I needed reinforcements, so I called your mom, and she went with me. It's useful to have a police officer around, bud. For example, she had a gizmo on her belt that opened the door to the warehouse. So that's why the door was unlocked. But she wasn't inside when Eve and Sophie and I arrived, was she? She was at her car getting a lantern, Yasmin said. And I guess calling in reinforcements too. She didn't realize how dangerous it was to be in the warehouse. I was getting ready to go home and check my other patients when the phone rang in another room and Mrs. Pop came in, holding out the receiver for Yasmin. It's okay with me, Mrs. Pop told Yasmin, if you feel up to it. When Yasmin was done, she handed the phone to me. Alex, it was Eve. In spite of all that had happened, she wanted to have a small party to celebrate her birthday. Could I come over later? I was looking at Yasmin and she nodded. She was going, so I said I would too. It's going to be tough for Eve now with her dad in trouble, Yasmin explained after I hung up. I mean, she'll probably have to go back to California, so... The least we can do is be nice the last day she's around. Nobody would blame me if I called Eve's birthday another disaster party. On the other hand, before the bad part happened, Eve told me something amazing. Professor Olivo had talked to the district attorney and convinced him that both Professor Henry and her uncle Jim 
um, and it had convinced him to keep both Professor Henry and her Uncle Jim out of jail. Say what? Crazy, huh? Eve said. Like you can imagine, she had a huge grin on her face. But Professor Olivo figured out it would be good if they could all work together instead of hating each other, since he, Professor Olivo, is interested in fracking and dad needs the chemical from fracking water to make his gasoline. Yasmin nodded. That makes a lot of sense. The three of us were on the sofa in the basement when Mrs. Henry where Mrs. Henry had set up games and party food, which, since the Henrys are from California, included guacamole. And since your dad and your uncle can't exactly work from jail, they'll probably stay out. Eve said, it's even possible that if dad pays back the ice carnival and pays to rebuild RSFZ, the judge will go easy on him. So, Yasmin said, you might not have to go back to California. Eve grinned. Yeah, you might be stuck with me for a while. Cool, said Sophie Sakura, who was listening in as usual. The disaster part happened when we sang happy birthday. Yasmin was singing her heart out. Eve didn't even crack a smile. But Toby Lee is just a bad little kid. My dad had sent over another chocolate cream pie and Toby picked it up and aimed it at Yasmin. I knew it was, I knew what a good arm he had with a light up Frisbee. So I moved to block his throw and succeeded. I blocked it with my face faster than you can say three stooges. All that singing turned to laughter. It was Yasmin who recovered first. Here, Alex, I'll help you clean up. Then Eve said, it's my party. I'll help him. And I said, sheesh, you guys don't have to fight over me. For a second, it was quiet. Then Yasmin and Eve together said, ew. The next thing you know, I was in the bathroom cleaning up my own face, looking in the mirror. I realized something. The mystery of who stole New Year's Eve had been solved, but the mystery of girls was going to take a little longer. The end. Oh my goodness! Oh, it was her dad! Oh. What a good ending. It had everything. It had explosions. It had sirens. It had everything. Oh. So come to find out. I was right. It was something in the water that made the ice sculptures. Oh. I was right. I might be good at detecting. <laughs> Anywho, my friends, any of you who stuck around for the end of Who Stole New Year's Eve, thank you so much. Wasn't it good, y'all? Wasn't it good? So I'm going to put out this weekend, I'm going to look in my chapter books and put out another chapter Put out some chapter books for you guys to vote this time and listen i need you to vote okay vote all right so huh, that is the end of who stole new year's eve oh my gosh that was so good now for my instagram friends unfortunately right instagram does not allow for me to post videos that are over an hour. So you are going to see this fabulous Fry Yay broadcast in two videos, okay? So you'll hear the first two books and then you will hear the ending of Who Stole New Year's Eve on its own, okay? 
With all of that being said, my friends, thank you so much for being here with me on this fabulous Friday broadcast of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Until our marvelous Monday broadcast, thank you so much for being here. Have a great and wonderful weekend. Maybe have a luau in your house if you are in a cold area of the United States, okay? And enjoy yourself like it is the Caribbean or Hawaii or something like that. But any way that you enjoy your weekend, have a safe and wonderful weekend. And I will see you right back here on our wonderful, oh, I'm sorry, our marvelous Monday broadcast of Miss. Hope's reading hour. Until then, my friends, I will see you next time. Bye.